Those nighttime pictures of planet Earth you see, taken far out in space, make it quite clear that there's not much in the way of complete darkness left here. The lights from our town, cities and traffic illuminate even the countryside, it seems. The tiny Channel Island of Sark is an exception, however. They're careful with their lights there and are proud that at night there's almost nothing but darkness. Visitors by the boatload arrive during the summer holiday season, but now, with winter on the way, Sark's long nights come into their own, and Christine Finn, who's just been there, says it's the perfect place for stargazing. Annie Dashinger is keen to give me a souvenir of Sark. I've arrived at her home at dusk, and as we have a cup of tea, waiting for the night to fall, she hands me a fridge magnet. It's a map of Sark, but not as the tourist brochure has it. Looking closely, I see a peninsula tweaked into the pointed hat of a witch. A broomstick is fashioned from the shape of the far west coast. There's a black cat in the far east. Annie is proud to introduce herself as a white witch. If that surprise didn't leave me coughing on my cuppa, her other title is Starfleet Commander of the island's astronomy group, Sastros. Just don't call her the chair. I didn't want a title that sounded like a piece of furniture, she says. Sark's 600-strong population is just as individual as the author Mervyn Peake found it in the 1940s. He was inspired to write a fiction about a man called Harold Pye, landed there on a mission to spread love. It's certainly a romantic place. There were two weddings the weekend I visited. A change in the law makes it easier for starry-eyed non-islanders to toast their marriage under one of the best views anywhere of Venus and Mars. And that's official. Sark was the first island in the world to achieve dark sky status. The international designation is so coveted, it's the first tourist sign you see coming up the steep way from the harbour, off the boat from the big island of Guernsey. Not that I noticed it, arriving as I did, in driving rain and wind, on a tractor-hauled charabank called the Toast Rack. Tractors are the only mechanised vehicles allowed on the island. The lack of cars, with their annoying headlights, makes it much easier for Sark to be lauded for its perfect darkness. There are no street lights either, and the most irritating light is likely to be that beaming down from the moon. Sark's dark sky has been scientifically endorsed. A team of experts made the hour-long boat crossing and carefully inspected the buildings on the island. They noted all the illuminations, advising on how essential lights could be pointed downwards and chasing other random glows out of the dark. Sastros has a helpful leaflet for incomers. Here in Sark, we note any new lighting. If this is excessive or inappropriate, we visit the offender and suggest a better, cheaper and less intrusive way of illuminating their property. The Sarkis, as they're called, take their dark sky very seriously. Many of the islanders keep binoculars to hand, and if venturing out at night, they'll mask their torches with red cellophane. Twice a year, Sark's Astronomy Society holds what it calls Starfest celebrations, with international guest speakers helping to promote Sark's bid for a proper island observatory. Just now, the Sarkis are gearing up for the Leonids, a shooting star display of up to 100 an hour that passes through the constellation of Leo at this time of year. Annie had just been hosting a meeting of dozens of star spotters of all levels of knowledge. A telescope was installed in her garden, and around it, necks strained back to follow the creamy trail of the Milky Way. There's plenty of potential for poetry. If the sighting of the Aurora Borealis in winter is not the shimmering green curtain of the Arctic, Sark's sky shows still inspire artists and photographers. In the words of stargazer Penny Preville, the island's own northern lights shimmer with the subtle striations of colour in the red spectrum, with duck egg blue just coming in as though introduced by an eyedropper. Walking in such pitch darkness takes some getting used to, and when the moon is but a sliver, imaginations work overtime. But, Penny says, nighttime here is far from scary. It's magical. Indeed, over tea at Annie's, talk turns to island folklore, ancient mysteries, and then darkens to the unexplained. Beyond the curtain windows, the night, just as Sastros promises, is very quiet, very dark, and utterly peaceful. We go outside again. Looking up into a sky lit by a waxing moon, Annie produces her wand, 
a laser pointer to make it easier to identify the constellations. Suddenly, a collective gasp. Just where Annie is pointing with a bright green ray, there emerges a massive, blazing shooting star, as if by magic, coaxed out of Sark's deep, dark sky. Magic in the skies over the Channel Islands.